So in my video where I talked about what I learned from doing game design for four years, I had a lot of people asking me to share some tips and tricks I learned from doing level designs as well. So in this video, I'm going to talk about what I learned overall after doing 100 plus level designs in game development. If you have any questions, feel free to ask in the comment section and join our Discord server with over 13,000 game developers where you can ask even more questions and find answers. And also, this video is brought to you by Catsoft Studios. Catsoft Studios are the ones who made Game Creator. Now, Game Creator is a collection of tools that will help you kickstart your game in a matter of minutes. It comes packed with ready-to-use, fully animated characters, a flexible, high-level scripting language, a complete cinematic camera system and much more basically anything you need to get started for making games one of the core features of game creator is its extensibility you can install different modules to further increase the amount of features you have at your disposal for example the inventory module will allow you to create equip and craft different items and the dialogue module will allow you to easily create branching conversations with timed choices. There's also a platform called Game Creator Hub where developers can freely share their own actions, conditions, and trigger component with other community members. You can check out more about Game Creator through the link in the description. So with that being said, let's talk about level design. So the first topic I want to talk about is making perspective scenes versus making fully playable scenes. Now, if you're not aware, perspective scenes are basically the types of level design that I do on this channel primarily. I do, I sometimes do the fully playable ones as well, especially whenever I worked as a freelancer back in the day. Um, but now I kind of focus on perspective scenes more. So basically a perspective design is where you have one single camera shot and build the level accordingly. I've been able to figure out after all this time of doing them that doing perspective scenes help planning the rest of the full playable scene as well. And perspective scenes can also help a lot when you pitch an idea to like a client if you work at a company or as a freelancer or to your boss, whatever it might be, um, or to yourself, right? Because it's a very nice kind of prototype of what you want to create as a full end product, but just like an idea, just like a pitch that you make in a couple of hours, which you can go back and edit really easily instead of having to like make the whole level and then going back and editing like an eight hour long work or maybe even more. So my suggestion about this topic is if you're working for a client as a freelancer or if you work at a company, if you even work alone and want to do some level design by yourself, I would suggest you to make a perspective scene at first and then build around it. Actually, speaking of which, the number two trick that I want to share with you guys is I find it easier to build the main highlights of the scene first and then construct around it. Now, what I mean by this is, for instance, in one of my speed level design videos that I'm going to try and show on the screen right now as well, I was building a village and I had a church in there which was elevated, it was placed on top of a cliff in the, like the center of the, the village pretty much um, and I wanted to focus on building that one first and then build the surrounding areas because it, it makes it so much easier to actually go back to the church or like the cliff itself and the environment, the surroundings and edit it when you actually focus on it first instead of having to build the whole level and then changing something about the cliff like the elevation or like the, the height or width, whatever it might be, which in return kind of changes the whole level as well, right? So making that first main highlighted part kind of makes it easier to have a vibe in your head. Like you set the style, the theme for your level design, and it makes it easier for you to go back and edit that. Now at one point in, in this timeline of yours as, as like a level designer, I want to say, uh, whenever you're working on level design, you're going to want to create something that's big in, in scale, right? So you're going to want to make some big landscape, a big city, a big village, whatever it might be, right? Big castle, whatever. Um, I've kind of come to realization that when making big scenes like that, scale is a big factor you should take into consideration, not only as a, as a big picture, but even as a small picture. Like every single object you place down, the, the scale of the objects, especially if they're far off or really close to the camera, they make a big difference. Like for instance, keeping the far off objects small, even if they're not very visible, gives the scene a more realistic perspective, which I prefer over having to focus on like 
you know, making the objects bigger just for the sake of visibility. If I really care about visibility that much, I either move the objects closer to the camera or I move the camera closer to those objects that I want visibility for. And honestly, the only reason to why I point this out is because I I often check like speed level design videos that people make on YouTube for like when using Unity and stuff. And I've seen a lot of people who try and make like a big scale environment like this, like a big landscape and stuff like that. And I just see a lot of people doing this mistake or making this mistake where they keep increasing the scale, the local scale on the objects that are far back into the scene, which are supposed to be small because that's what puts the perspective into realism, right? Same with stuff like trees and other types of vegetation. I see a lot of people increasing the size and the local scale for those objects that are far back into the scene, like a forest or like a mountain and where you have some trees on the mountains. And it's like, no, those are supposed to be small. Like you're kind of making them bigger than the mountain itself. So when you're making something of a big scale for level design, it's always worth spending a few hours playing around with the assets you're going to be using. If they are your assets, you're probably going to know them better than you know anybody else. But if it's a third party asset or like an asset pack from the Unity Asset Store, etc., 100% you should be spending some time playing around with these assets and learning about their scales and then change the scales accordingly if you feel the need of it. On top of that, adding some objects close to the player, both small and big in scale, helps make the scale factor in the scene more clear for the player, which is really important. For instance, placing a tree near the player and some smaller objects like grasses, you know, boxes, benches and stuff like that, and then populating your scene, the rest of your scene, like farther back, um, with, you know, whatever visionary you have in your mind, such as like trees and mountains and stuff, that's good. But keeping something that is close to the player with a realistic scale, I want to say, like a standard scale, is always good because it puts the immersion into player's head. I've also realized that just like when you're making a game in general, you spend hours upon hours on a level design non-stop, which means that the design you make can become boring for you to look at after like staring at it for five hours straight, whereas other people might love it. And therefore, I feel like it's always very important to have someone else checking it too, either actively or like frequently or sometime, just even once helps. Um, for instance, when I worked as a freelancer, having my clients check it allowed for feedback and for honest opinions and also for just hearing how it looks right because I can be like oh this looks good but maybe somebody else doesn't like it or maybe after seven hours of working on the design I may think hey maybe I should like redo the whole thing whereas the client or the other person checking it for me might love it and that's that's what I'm trying to like point at so TLDR um, just get someone who can check your project a little bit like every hour or whatever um, just make sure it's not your mom because she's gonna be very supportive all the time like I remember when I was showing my mom the first level design I did she was like you made this oh my god you should be working for a company I was like mom are you sure about that but still parents rock okay show your parents too. make them proud another idea that I have um, you're probably gonna think like oh my god how did you come up with this idea but you can also record a video and do a time lapse of it when you start doubting yourself um if you're asking i do a lot of speed level design videos on this channel so that's why i know um they're honestly though they've been very very helpful because i can now track how much how much of an improvement that i had ever since i started which is actually kind of insane given the fact that i was learning by myself and it doesn't even have to be videos if you really don't feel like making a video out of it you can take progress pictures and make sure you just keep looking at what it used to look like for like an hour ago for two hours ago and all the way back when you actually got started oh geez the next topic is really good i want to talk a little bit about adding life into your scenes because oh my god i've been checking so many speed level design videos on youtube at this point where I see a lot of like very beautiful, you know, sceneries with landscapes, mountains and, you know, all this nature scene and there's no life in it. It just doesn't feel natural. It just kind of breaks the immersion. Add some, I, I don't know, add some animals in there. Add some particles like dust flying around or leaves falling from the trees. You know, add some sticks on the ground affected a little bit by the wind or water, objects in motion, literally anything, including wind on grass and trees, which is kind of like a standard at this point. Like it's a very standard quality assurance for 
for a level design. If you don't have wind, it just looks weird. You know what? If you're making a forest, throw in some rabbits, throw in some birds flying, you know, above the scene. It doesn't have to be like a very complex animation system or like a super complex animal system where something pops up and somebody else comes around and stuff like that. It doesn't really need to be that. You can just have something staring at the camera, staring at the water, moving around, you know, rotating, whatever. Um, just as, as long as you have some kind of motion and something that people, the players and the viewers can relate to in your scene, I feel like that's what makes it realistic. We were talking about grass and I wanna point out two more things. Adding multiple entities of grass with different but matching colors is key for realistic grass. Like if you only have one entity or basically like one grass type, let's say, let's call it grass type. If you have one grass type in a portion of your scene, it may look good depending on the size of it, but if you have like a big field, then it's probably better if you have, you know, some other types of grass as well. And the scale on grasses also make a big difference. So you don't really have to like have the same height and width on every single grass in your scene. You can make it smaller, you can make it shorter, but thicker. You can make it thin, like thinner, but longer. Like you can play around with those things because you have the options. Like for instance, in Unity, you have full customizability over that kind of thing. So just play around with it. And I mean, if you check out my speed level designs where I make forest scenes, it only looks, I would say it only looks natural because I do that, like I use that technique. I, I have grass that is shorter and I have grass that is longer at the same spot. So they pretty much end up completing each other, which, which looks really good. And one more thing is having ambient occlusion for vegetation shadowing is also key to achieve realistic grass and other types of vegetation actually, um, like trees and bushes. Cause ambient occlusion is not just like, it's it's a post-processing effect that people normally use for like the, the edges of, you know, game objects or like the corners and stuff like that, which looks good. I'm gonna agree to that. But you can also make it more affecting towards grass and it just adds basic basically like a very natural kind of shadowing amongst grass which is very important because you you know grass like grass blades cast shadows to other grass blades as well so kind of stimulating that through ambient occlusion and just adding some occlusion to begin with amongst grass just makes it look better before ending the video i want to talk about two more topics number one Lighting is incredibly important and you're gonna be like, I know, but hear, hear me out. Where shadow set can change the entire vibe and look of a level. So if you wanna keep the shadows as they are because it looks better with the light direction and stuff like that, but you wanna change the darkness of the shadows, make sure you're using real-time GI or also called real-time global illumination or global illumination in general, right? Um, and add some ambient lighting as well. Additionally, you can also add extra light source into your scene to light up the dark spots of your scene, like where you have very harsh shadows casting onto some objects that you actually wanna kind of like light up a little bit. You can add some like spotlights or maybe even a directional light that's gonna affect only the layer that's set for that specific game object or specific group of objects. So you can make make the directional light only hit those objects and light them up a little bit. It doesn't have to be like a very high intensity type of light, but just something. And most important part of this video, um, best way of learning level design and game design to begin with, is by doing it over and over and over again, and not just repeating necessarily the same old designs you've been doing, but actually doing new and challenging ones you've never tried before on top of repetition though. So just because I'm saying like not necessarily just repeating the same old designs, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't repeat the old designs, you should still do it. But on top of it, don't forget to do new and challenging ones you've never tried before as well. If you are very good with nature scenes and you know that, focus on some, I don't know, horror interior scenes, or maybe focus on some, you know, sci-fi cities or whatever. If, you, if you're not in a very, very, very specific niche in a company where you, where you, you guys are working on like a sci-fi game and you only need sci-fi stuff, why not try it out? Why not just build your experiences? I've been having a lot of people asking me these types of questions on every single level design video I've been making so far. So I just wanted to point that out. Like, the best way of learning this stuff 
is literally by doing it. Like you can't really sit down and be taught how to do level design. I wasn't taught, I just tried my way forward. I sucked at it. I was really intimidated by level design and game design to begin with. And then I just got better and better and better and now I'm at this point. All right, so those are some really neat tricks that I learned from doing level design and game design for so long. Now, if you have any questions or feel like you need help, don't worry and make sure to leave a comment on this video. And you should also join our Discord server by going to the link in the description. Our server has over 13,000 like-minded game developers, which is still crazy to say, um, who can all help you improve and grow your skills, whether it's a level design game designer, you know, programmer, game developer in general, or whatever you might be interested in, because it's 13,000 people. I'm sure someone knows something about your niche as well. <laughs> now, if you guys enjoyed watching and want to see more videos like this one, make sure to give this video a thumbs up and hit the subscribe button below the video to stay up to tune for new content. Also, make sure to turn on the bell notification icon, whatever it's called. I don't know, what do you, what do you call it? Bell icon, bell notifications, YouTube notifications, whatever. Um, but turn it on <laughs> so you get notified whenever I post something new on this channel. All right, so with that being said, I'm going to be super active in the comment section and in our Discord server. So I hope to see you guys there. Thanks for watching and have a good night. Peace out, guys. If I know